I suspect that some of you are going to be surprised at the subject of this telecast. can see a press of excited youngsters from all over the region are on hand for the return of Elvis Presley to Tupelo, Mississippi, the town where he was born. Elvis Presley's world was spinning at the speed of light when he returned home on September 21st, 1956 for a benefit concert. His shaking hips and curled lips were sending rock and roll shockwaves around the world, causing parents to panic, even in Tupelo. In just a few short years, he'd been transformed from a shy truck driver to the number one singing sensation in America. Gold records, movie deals, sold out concerts, screaming fans, and a ratings busting appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show catapulted him to the top. His journey from a complete unknown to an entertainment icon began in Tupelo, Mississippi. 90 miles south of Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> the dramatic rise of Elvis Presley is forever linked to Tupelo, Mississippi. It's the importance of a place in biography. It's the foreground, it isn't the background. You can hear the soil in Elvis as you can hear the cement in Frank Sinatra. In the early 1930s, Tupelo changed from a sleepy farming community into a bustling center of commerce and manufacturing that attracted people like Vernon and Gladys Presley. The promise of prosperity was in the air when their son Elvis was born here on January 8, 1935, in the family's two-room shotgun shack. He was born in the early morning hours and they didn't know it at the time, but uh, Gladys Presley was carrying twins. And the first baby was stillborn. The fact that his twin died haunted him for the rest of his life. On the one hand, he felt triumphant. And on the other hand, I think he felt a sense of guilt that he had lived and the other had died and that he had to do enough living for the both of them. As a result of him having a twin who died, his birth took on special meaning to his mother. And his father would later claim that that night, he went out and looked at the morning sky and saw a blue streak in the sky. And his mother would go on to claim that she saw rings around the moon that night. The fact that one child died and the other survived, I think made that child more precious to both of them and especially so to Gladys. She saw signs that something special was going to come of, of her son, Elvis Aaron. She would tell them that when he was little growing up and that there was a reason that he had survived. Tupelo, Mississippi offered Vernon and Gladys hope, but the depression kept it from becoming the land of golden opportunity. And my aunt and uh, Vernon, Elvis's father, would uh, get up every morning and, and they'd walk the levee from East Tupelo to Tupelo. And uh, Vernon worked at a wholesale grocery 
warehouse over in town. And then uh, mother, my aunt, was a, uh, a seamstress. The kind of money they made for a 40 hour work week was uh, $2 and a half a week. It was a hard scrabble life for young Elvis and his family. But Gladys Presley refused to allow tough times to overwhelm them. Elvis's mother worked hard. She had various jobs. She worked in a laundry. She worked in a garment factory. She picked cotton. Gladys would pull him on the cotton sack, down one row and up the other, as did many mothers in the cotton field. So he spent many of those early months being pulled on a cotton sack up and down rows on a cotton field. He heard the music that was being sung by the workers in the cotton fields and that it was a combination of blues, African, you know, kind of gospel sounds. He definitely was a sponge for all the musical influences around him. But all this music and the special destiny his mother had predicted for him was nearly cut short on April 5th, 1936, when the worst natural disaster in Tupelo's history struck. Well, that night, uh, it became deathly still about 9 o'clock. There was just no air that you could breathe. The humidity was terrible, and uh, it was deadly quiet. But there was a flashes of lightning back over in the southwest, just constant lightning. Everybody was sitting in their yard or on a porch swing or something when the, the roaring noise started, and it sounded like about two freight trains running wide open, the roaring. My daddy had me in the storm house, and he was watching out the door, and he said, oh, Lord, it's blowing. Keep blow away. The presidents were at church. Her father heard the storm warnings and commandeered a school bus so he could drive the family to safety. They hid at her uncle's home while waiting out the storm. When it was over, they saw fires lighting up all across town. The men piled into the school bus and drove back into town to lend a hand. Gladys and Elvis went to see if they still had a home. It survived. It went back on that side of uh, Presley's. It, it done some damage to it, but it didn't, uh, didn't tear it up completely. It just done some minor damage. To it. Gladys saw their salvation as a sign that confirmed her faith in religion. She was the guiding light. Gladys Presley was probably the one that, uh, that brought Elvis up. And she made him go to church. Now, he, was, he went to church. The biggest thing we did back in those days was uh, we were in church three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. The Presleys and their neighbors attended the nearby Assembly of God Church, which was unlike the more staid Baptist or Methodist churches. It was nothing for people to run down the aisles shouting, you know, that's the assembly of God. And if they felt happy, they jumped, they shouted, they ran. People would talk in tongues, and they would lose control and do little jitterbug-like dances. It was just a ball of activity. Music was a big part of these, of these churches, and little Elvis was exposed to all of that. Brother Frank Smith, I have heard preach myself, and in the middle of a sermon, he would just say, I think we need a song, reach over and pick up his guitar, sing a song, and then go right back into his sermon. You know, just as easy as having a conversation. He encouraged the children to take part. All the kids would make a beeline and get up there in that choir, especially on Sunday night. Brother Frank taught them songs. After Sunday school was over, I'd gather the children down around the altar and sing a few courses. Then I'd pray with them. And we did that between Sunday school and preaching time. And it wasn't always about Bible songs. 
and he had heard uh, Red Foley sing Old Shell, so he decided to teach it to all the kids. But Elvis was the only one that just embraced it and, and made it his song. So every time he had an opportunity to perform, forever, he did Old Shell. I remember the time at the old With Tupelo and the rest of the country still gripped by the Great Depression, times were hard for the Presley clan. But at least the church and his mother provided a measure of inspiration for the young Elvis. Though his father, Vernon, was struggling. He did work. He worked a series of, of kind of odd jobs for a number of years, but he also relied a great deal on his kind of a roguish charm. And he wound up getting into some trouble with the law in Tupelo. Vernon Presley's charm streak ran out in 1938 when he crossed their landlord, Orville Bean, a major developer who was considered the kingpin in the area. It was very difficult times. And he and uh, one of Gladys's uh, brothers and another friend had pooled their efforts together to raise a pig into a hog so that they could sell it. They sold the hog to uh, Orville Bean, and Orville paid them uh, what he felt was a fair price. But the boys didn't feel it was a fair price. They really felt slighted. And apparently they went out one night and had a lot of moonshine and decided they'd get Orville Bean by adding a zero to the check and turning it into a $40 check. Orville Bean found out about it, and they were prosecuted for fraud. Vernon and his accomplices were finally sentenced to three years in prison at the notorious Parchment Farm Penitentiary, America's Gulag, as it's been called. Former Mississippi Governor James K. Vardaman described it as a prison farm designed to run like an efficient slave plantation. Putting a man in that really wasn't a criminal, per se, in with some real hardened criminals had to be a terrible experience. But Parchment at that time was totally self-sufficient. That meant they got up at crack of dawn and worked in the fields until sunset. It was, it was no party being in prison during that period. It was no party for Gladys and Elvis back in Tupelo. Gladys could not continue to make the payments for the house here on the old Saltilla Road, and Orville Bean kicked them out. They stayed with relatives near the cotton mill while waiting for Vernon's release. And so that was kind of a turning point because they were kind of at the mercy of family members. Elvis and his mother often took a five-hour bus ride to the prison for visits with Vernon on Sundays. What's really kind of pivotal about the Parchment era is that it really solidified the bond between mother and son because Vernon was away. And so this very strong mother-son bond was taking place. It would never be broken. I think she really tries very hard to negate that impact of his father being in prison and what that means for a young man like Elvis. Elvis, even though he was tiny, took on a kind of almost a paternal role, you know, that he had to take care of his mother. And he called her a little baby, even when he was tiny. And the neighbors said it was the cutest thing they ever saw. And he would say, does my little baby need anything? And he himself was only, you know, four years old. I think his mother really uh, inspires in him that, you know, you can, you know, be something. Freud said that if a boy is the, his mother's undisputed darling, he retains the feeling of confidence that very often leads to success for the rest of his life. Early on, he learned he had to work hard to attain that success. We'd go around picking up scrap iron and, and setting it. We'd had, had us a little red wagon, and we'd uh, pull, that, pull, pull those around. We'd pick up iron and stuff. And then once we'd get us a pretty good wagon full, we'd uh, 
take it to Tupelo and sell it to get money to go to the movies on. We learned at an early age, you know, you had to uh, kind of get out there and get it on your own. Gladys also understood that you had to take matters into your own hands to get things done. When she heard that letters and a petition sent to the governor could get a prisoner paroled, she went to work. Gladys took a petition around door to door with her little child in tow and pleaded for people to sign this petition so that her husband would get an early release. The pleas from Gladys and letters from prominent citizens, including the chief of police, a banker, the sheriff, and even Orville Bean, who felt Vernon had been sufficiently punished, got results. He was finally given an indefinite suspension of sentence in February of 1939. Back in Tupelo, the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, provided him a laborer's job that kept the struggling family going. When the United States entered World War II, his friends told him about the crying need for workers in the booming defense plants in nearby Memphis, Tennessee. Vernon headed north. Gladys and Elvis stayed behind in Tupelo, moving into a house next to the black section of town, Shake Rag. Vernon came home on the weekends, but there still wasn't enough money to make ends meet. They just scratched pennies to get by. And a lot of times they didn't have money. Sometimes somebody would give them some money, you know, to help them get on with life. My mother would send food down there by my dad, a basket of food, whether it was a cake or whatever we had left over, and give it to the Presleys. And they accepted anything you gave. A wholesaler donated fruits and vegetables that were past the point of sale. These would be doled out to the needy in East Tupelo. Ms. Presley would come by periodically and say, when are we going to get a load of bananas and whatever fruits and vegetables? Maybe that's where Elvis uh, learned to love banana and peanut butter sandwiches. He probably ate a lot of them when he was just a little boy. You know that family was looked down on in that town. Not just lived across the tracks, they spent a time living in the black neighborhood, which in the 40s and 50s, that is grinding poverty. That's the epitome of what was called white trash. In 1941, Elvis was enrolled at Lawhorn Elementary School, where he made an important new friend. James Osborne. He said, I really like going around with you. He said, you're quiet, easy going, and says you don't uh, raise king with nobody or fight with anybody. He said, I like that. And I said, well, I like you too because you, you do the same thing. And uh, so we just made it together there. All through elementary school, these young boys lived a Huckleberry Finn existence of skinny dipping, fishing, and stopping for burgers and an RC Cola at Johnny's. Elvis would say, uh, let's go get us an ROC, Royal Crown Cola, ROC. And uh, I know what he was talking about. And we'd go out there and get us one and sit there. A lot of times we couldn't eat. We'd just sit there and, and drink an RC Cola. And a lot of times we'd get one and we'd come up here on top of this hill where we at today. And we'd drink that drink up here and sit and kick our feet around, you know, off this big hill. While passing the time together, the boys often talked about their dreams. Elvis said he dreamed about singing on Tupelo's W-E-L-O radio station. James's older brother Carville had a radio show on WELO where he performed under the name Mississippi Slim. He reminded me of Hank Williams, sort of. He just, you know, I always wore a cowboy hat. And, um, he had his program, and everyone, I guess he was the main entertainment in Tupelo at that time. He said, I would like to go up there and see him and meet him. And I said, okay, we'll go one Saturday. 
And I introduced him to my brother. Elvis said, I'd like to be on your program one of these days. And brother said, uh, I tell you what, said, uh, if you'll come up here on Saturday and let me play the guitar for you and you sing, when I think you're good enough, I'll let you on my program. And when he thought it got good enough, he told him, he said, you be up here next Saturday and I'm gonna let you be on my program. Elvis hitchhiked into town. The very first Saturday, he chickened out. But Slim told him to come back the next Saturday. So brother says, come on up, Elvis. And bro Elvis got up and walked up there and caught the microphone and says, uh, I'm ready. I was with him the first time he sang at WLO and uh, he was very nervous, but he, he did really well. And guess what he sang? Old Shep. Old Shep was his standard. Just a boy and his dog. My first memory of Elvis was when we both attended Lawhorn School when we, Elvis was in the fifth grade and I was in the third grade. Elvis was fortunate in fifth grade to have a teacher that was in tune with her students. He came in Mistress Aletha Grimes' class. She helped participate in the Friday chapel programs. The chapel programs were held in the school's auditorium. It was the first thing in the morning, and she said, who will, uh, will, will do the prayer? And Elvis raised his hand, and he did the prayer. And, uh, and then without you know, skipping a beat, he went into Old Shep. She was so impressed that that particular year, 1945, they were going to have the first ever talent contest at the Mississippi-Alabama Fair and Dairy Show. And Ms. Grimes and uh, Mr. Tracy Franks, our principal, entered Elvis and I into the contest. Mrs. Grimes was Orville Bean's daughter. So an earlier villain, you might say, in, in the Presley life uh, rises to the occasion in the form of Mrs. Grimes to give Elvis that little pat on the back that we all need sometime in life. The talent show run by Charlie Boren, the station manager at WELO, attracted kids from all over Tupelo. It was held on the main stage of the fairgrounds. I can remember walking down Main Street with all the children in the parade. <laughs> and when it was time for the, uh, the talent show in the fairground to begin, uh, they took Elvis and I down to the grandstand, and I had to stand on the stool because the mics were so tall. There were about 10 contestants, I believe, and I think it was limited to children uh, 12 and under. Elvis sang Old Ship, uh, acapella. And no, uh, no guitar, nothing. And uh, as I recall, he was pretty nervous at, uh, at the tender age. I won third, and a girl singer named Nubbin Payne won second, and I have no idea who won fourth. The audience determined the winner by applause. I won first place in a $25 war bond and a trophy and free rides to all the rides in the fair, and Elvis won fifth place in $5. Losing at the state fair didn't deter Elvis from trying to sing on WELO again. We know one thing. He knew he was going to give it everything he had. It was the big time, and WELO could be heard probably for a 100-mile radius. So, you know, he was reaching a pretty good little audience there. Charlie Boren told Elvis what he had to do to get back on the radio. And he said, well, Elvis, if you will please not sing Old Shep, I'll let you be on there. But when he recorded Old Shep and sold a million, he called Charlie and told him. <laughs> said, I've sold a million of Old Shep, Charlie, and you wouldn't let me sing it. And he said, man, I wish I'd pay more attention. <laughs> Like most boys his age, Elvis liked BB guns and rifles. That's what he wanted for his 11th birthday in 1945. But his mother worried about his choice. So he and Gladys hitchhiked into uh, Tupelo, to Tupelo Hardware, to look at guns. Now, I think Gladys knew when she left the house they weren't going to bring a gun home. She just didn't know how she was going to change the scenario. When a young boy would walk in this store, they would generally gravitate to the to the uh, ammunition and the rifles across the store. Gladys would have probably seen the guitar in the music counter and thought more that that would be a safer and a more appropriate gift. 
Elvis and his mother came in one morning. He was anxious to buy a rifle. I showed him the rifle first, and then I took it and showed him his guitar. He enjoyed that too. He told his mother he didn't have money enough to buy the guitar. It was 775, I believe. She told him, said, I'll finish paying the guitar out, but give up to you buying a rifle. I think he was pulled between two things, his peers and what his heart desired. I think he was really tickled to get the guitar. Elvis quickly learned to play his new guitar. I had some uncles that, that, that picked the guitar a little bit, and I, I sat around and watched them all the time. And, and, uh, I just, just picked it up watching them, but I, mean, I never thought I would make anything doing it, you know? The preacher helped Elvis, too, play a guitar. He was a guitar player, and he helped show the chords on the guitar to Elvis, too. I showed him the first three chords. There was G and D and C. And C. The first person Elvis went to when he got the guitar was for the Frank Smith, same guy that had taught him to sing Old Shep. Frank taught him a few chords, and he said, son, if you can play these three chords, you can play anything. He couldn't wait to show his friend what he'd learned. He uh, wanted to know if uh, we wanted to come here and play his guitar that his mother had bought him. So he brought his little guitar out and he, he sang old ship to us. He knew two or three chords. He wasn't all that good, but uh, his voice was always really good. He didn't shake his hips or uh, uh, move his arm or do any of those things back in those days. We were uh, too busy, I guess, uh, trying to rush him up so we could get to the creek bank and take a swim. <laughs> Elvis loved his guitar, but he was too self-conscious to bring it to his new school, Milam Junior High. But Mrs. Dewey Camp, his sixth grade teacher, announced in class one morning that she was going to have a chapel program. Are there any children that can play an instrument or sing? She said, Elvis shot his hand up, you know, and he came and he lit up. Elvis raised his little hand timidly back there. He said, I could play the guitar and sing. And I said, well, bring that thing tomorrow and, and sing for us. So he did the next morning, and it was so good, and the children were so pleased with him, and I was, I was just so overjoyed. After his triumph, Elvis couldn't wait to take his guitar to school. He'd get up on the top of his desk and sit down, and he'd play the, the guitar and sing Old Shep or God Bless My Daddy. The teacher there had to close the windows when he sang because all the children in all the other classes would just stop at this end. But not everyone was a fan. I remember vividly one time uh, some of the more, I won't say criminal element, but rougher type boys um, who were sort of jealous of Elvis's friends and of Elvis's talent at that time, which was very uh, obvious. I scolded his guitar while we were in physical education and cut the strings, and all the boys got together and bought a new set of strings for him, and he had his guitar repaired. He became kind of ridiculed because he was less prosperous than, than the others around, and he was bullied, and jibes made at him. Kids are the cruelest people on earth, and they've always got to pick on someone, and who do they usually pick to pick on? The one person who marches to his own beat, and that was certainly Elvis. To escape, Elvis found sanctuary in a place where money didn't matter and being different could be a virtue. The world he found in his favorite comic books. Elvis uh, said I was the hero of every comic book I ever read, and, and that gets said and said and said, but he never gets said which comic books he liked. So I went uh, to a comic store. They gave me a pile, and I sat there. As I was flipping through, I came across Captain Marvel Jr. And I thought, it's Elvis. It is Elvis. It's the sideburns, the uh, glossy black hair, uh, the lightning bolt emblem used everywhere on the uh, uh, bracelets he gave people. But he took his personality, too. His personality was humble and humorous. That is what he projects when he, you know, as the king, when he meets all his subjects. Unfortunately, there was no superhero interceding on the president's behalf. 
and the post-war recession made it hard for Vernon to find enough work to pay the rent. He'd returned home to Tupelo with high hopes, but his delivery man job, loans, and some say stints as a moonshine runner just weren't enough. They had to move to a less expensive house on Green Street. There was a mixed neighborhood. Several white and black lived right there together. And uh, I lived with my grandparents, and they owned most of the property in that area. We had our own place to play. We had uh, watermelon patches and peanut patches and, and pear trees and fig trees and little swimming holes and fishing holes and pipe water coming out of the bank. So it wasn't any black and white thing during that time. Uh, we, were just, we were just boys. We managed boys doing our boy thing. When they left their idyllic neighborhood, they'd go to the fairgrounds or the movie theater. White entrance on the front side, on the Broadway side, and black entrance on the south side. But he'd go into the white entrance and then climb over, climb over, and here we are, there we are. He wouldn't have had it any other way. <laughs> he wouldn't have gone if he'd had to sit by himself over there with somebody else. So. Well, when Elvis lived uh, on the hill, which was the historical black, uh, one of the two historical black neighborhoods, he would go with his friend Sam Bell to uh, tent revivals. They used to have what they called Sanctified Church, and they would they would put a tent out there. Every year they put a big tent out. Man, he couldn't stay out of there. We had to go with him down there. He'd go in there, he'd be singing. He'd be singing in that tent. They welcomed him in. And as soon as the welcome was extended, I mean, he got right in the middle of everything. But he, we thought he was fanatical because he liked to go so much. So, man, we'd be wanting to do something else, but he wanted to go down there. He said, man, we're going to that old sanctified church. Yeah, man, I got to go. <laughs> Had to go. <laughs> it didn't bother them. They looked like they expected him to come. Elvis discovered another kind of music across the tracks and shake rag. He had heard sanctified gospel from the black churches. He had heard country music from WLO radio and the Grand Ole Opry. But it was shake rag that introduced Elvis to the blues. The only way I remember Elvis Presley was a kid, you know. Back across the track at that time, we had a little string band over there. It was on Saturdays, they'd give these house parties, you know, fish fries and house parties and things. And then he'd slip over there sometime, late, when they'd give those dances, and peep and watch from women and men both shaking and going on. So that's where he got his shaking from. His mother was the same way. People said about her in her youth. She did a mean Charleston. And they said about Elvis, he got it natural. Elvis had rhythm. Yeah, he'd go down there and he'd, he'd listen because they played some down hard blues down there at Shake Ray. Well, he loved black singers. One time he said, the Lord messed up on me in two ways. He didn't make me black and didn't make me a bass singer. Elvis was definitely colorblind. He saw the person or he heard their music or their story. He was fascinated with people, and especially people that music played an integral part of their lives. And that's all he saw. It wasn't all music all the time. Elvis was getting older and beginning to be interested in girls. One thing I find fascinating is girls, 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 again, at a very early age. One of my best friends, uh, Eloise Sanifer, was his, really his first girlfriend. And uh, he had written her a lot of notes. And then he wrote one day, she said he wrote her a note saying that he was breaking up with her and starting to like Magdalene Morgan. He was cute and shy, and he was just captivated my heart. That's all it was to it. He was just my guy from day one. And I guess I was his gal, so <laughs> it was nice. The romance with Magdalene was short-lived. Things still weren't working out for his father, Vernon, in Tupelo. I think what it was, he couldn't make payments on what he is li where he's living. In November 1948, the family sold their furniture and loaded their 1939 Plymouth with everything they owned and left Tupelo in the middle of the night. 
Destination, the big city, Memphis, Tennessee. Fall of 1948, Elvis and his family arrived in Memphis. While just a short drive from Tupelo, it was a bustling city that offered a chance for them to finally escape a life of dead-end poverty. Elvis would later say, we were broke, man, broke. And he and his mom and dad wound up living in a boarding house. The three of them shared one room and all the residents had to use the sink in the bathroom for water to cook on uh, with hot plates and such. You're talking about right after World War II when people had a tough time finding good housing, particularly people that were in certain income brackets. So it was a tough way to live, but Gladys got work right away. It took Vernon a little longer. And they eventually, through um, public assistance, it was called the Memphis Housing Authority. They were able to live at a place called Lauderdale Courts. The Lauderdale Courts was great. They had hardwood flooring, and they was, had to stay spotless. They had the best steam heat that you could have. The housing projects that emerged in the post-World War II period were seen, particularly for whites, they were seen as temporary spaces. In fact, Lauderdale Courts was not to be ashamed. Back in that day, it was like living in a real nice apartment. It was a great place to move up. This particular apartment that we were in building had 54 apartments in it. So you can imagine how many kids, some of them your same age, going to the same schools, living in the same area. He liked to show off his guitar and his collection of comic books, which he had on display. He picked up that little guitar he had and he started playing. Well, I didn't know anything about guitars and that surprised me. And, and he was singing little ballad type songs, you know, which to me, man, that was great because he had a voice. I don't care if it's the first time I ever heard him, he had a voice. He's a pre-teenager and he's gonna start going to high school, which terrifies his mother, by the way, because Memphis is a huge city compared to Tupelo. Mrs. Presley, would kind of walk behind him. She wanted to make sure he went to school. He was a little nervous about going to that school and he expressed a little, you know, thoughts about it. The population of his high school, the Humes High School in Memphis, is just as big as Tupelo uh, in 1948. It was a really huge culture shock for Elvis coming from a small Tupelo school to a school that had 2,000 kids in it. So that was, that was kind of, uh, strange for Elvis and, and kind of a little bit shocking. If you're ball headed, tear him out with a peg leg running through the front door and tell him Philip sent you down there from real hot blue. Well, now that's all right, no mama. Elvis right, and other young people discovered something else that was shocking. A late night show on WHBQ called Red Hot and Blue, hosted by Dewey Phillips. Right now, it's old Phillips being Red Hot and Blue coming through WHBQ and Hotel Tisca on the magazine floor. That Maybelline Floor. Oh, that's right, they changed the name. Maybelline Floor right in good old Memphis, Tennessee. He was a wild man on the radio. He had no compunction about saying anything or doing anything. He, he, he was strictly within bounds, something unlike anybody we'd ever heard in radio. He was truly uh, something different. Phillips was hired to play music intended to appeal to an African-American audience blues, spirituals, and rhythm and blues. Music that was taboo to play during the day for the station's mostly white audience. In those days, 1952, 53, 54, we were still playing what I term vanilla music. In the morning on my show and during all the day parts of uh, WHBQ, we played Patti Page and Joe Stafford, uh, even some big bands. Everybody in Memphis was talking about this crazy guy at night playing these rhythm and blues songs, interrupting the records, doing crazy stunts on the air, and talking like nuts. He was a star, and everybody listened to him. You know, they'd check in anyway, riding around at night, you know. Let's see what Dewey's doing. He's always doing something wacky. We kind of had to, um, you know, listen to that when we were in the car on the way to somewhere. We did not listen to that at home. 
but uh, it was uh, all the young people to listen to it. And I don't think we thought about the fact that they were black when they were singing. It was just music that we liked to hear. So we would listen to it off of that station. Dewey introduced a whole new audience to, uh, to this music and would later be the catalyst for introducing what we know now and what Alan Freed would later term rock and roll. And Elvis used to tell his friends, listen to this, and turn the dial on, on the radio and say, listen to this guy, listen to what he's playing. Elvis was drawn to the sights and sounds of African-American music and culture he found in Memphis. Walking the streets, he heard the blues and rhythm and blues. He also discovered where the musicians bought their flamboyant clothes. Lansky Brothers was the one that was featuring those style of clothing in Memphis, and Elvis would go down there, and he felt it was cool to look different. One Friday, he came in there. He had a uh, $10 bill, he bought two shirts. $5 shirts. Man, he was clean. He come back and said, how do I look? I said, man, you clean his Ajax. He's really sharp. Elvis saw the clothes in there that uh, basically made him stand out, just like it did for African-American kids or African-American uh, artists, rhythm and blues artists. He wants to be noticed. So he tunes into popular culture. He tunes into movies. He tunes in uh, to radio. He grows his, his hair, uh, like perhaps James Dean or Tony Curtis. Elvis loved a movie Tony Curtis made called City Across the River, where he's kind of a young, tough guy. And Elvis noticed that his black hair looked great and photographed really well. And Elvis was starting to understand about the power of the camera, the power of the image. He looked kind of roguish, and uh, I didn't ever know what that word meant, really, but it was kind of a rough, kind of a bad boy look, maybe, I guess. And, and I think that's probably the look that he wanted to get across, but he was not. He was not that at all. He's seen as different. He's seen as odd. Uh, even by his contemporaries in school. Again, many of them are, are tough. He had to defend his look from some guys who tried to cut his hair in the bathroom and from some teachers who picked on him. We had a real old school type coach and the coach gave him a hard time because of his hair. And uh, all of the teachers did, and our woodshop teacher, he would, he would make a little comment sometime about him, about his hair or something. But one teacher heard he could sing and asked him to perform at an upcoming class Christmas party. One of the things we was going to do is have a little Christmas party. Mrs. Shillings was going to let us have a little time that, that day, so Elvis was going to bring his guitar. Like many, Elvis was shy in high school. And unlike when he was in elementary school and junior high, he'd never taken his guitar to Hume's before. He was going to carry his guitar to school that day and sing during a party. But when we got to school that day, he was still bashful enough, even though he had performed it when he was younger, kids and things, but he didn't bring his guitar and he didn't sing that day. Hoping it would help their friend Elvis overcome his shyness and fears about singing in public, Buzzy and Paul Dewar convinced Elvis to sing for the patients and staff at the home for the incurables. I think that night really helped him a lot, because it wasn't long after that until they they had the uh, talent show at, at school. Elvis practiced all week for the talent show. It's at night time, and it's a big thing. They had all kind of uh, people. Some would sing, some was playing, some was tumbling. They're doing all kind of different shows. Paul Dewar and I were sitting together in all this, and Elvis come out and sang his song. Of course, everybody went crazy over it. It's a song, keep your cold, icy fingers off of me. Now, how is that so much? But Elvis had a way of juicing it up and making it good. Anyway, he won the talent show. At that moment, when he won the high school talent show, you, you know, I just wondered. I was on the front row, and I said, you know, maybe he's got a chance. He graduated from high school in 1953 and found a job at Precision Tool Company. But music was his dream, and against all odds and the expectations of nearly everyone, he set out to break into the music business. He needed to get attention and help from someone who could give him a break. Elvis read about the Memphis Recording Services and Sun Records in the newspaper. 
He thought its owner, Sam Phillips, was the key to realizing his ambitions. After the war, Phillips was working as an announcer and engineer for a Memphis radio station when he discovered an unmet need. Sam Phillips realized that there was a market out there for African-American blues music that people wanted to hear. The major recording companies, um, it wasn't within their realm at the moment. Sam thought like the people on the street. You know, he didn't think like a big executive type. He understood that white kids particularly were becoming infatuated with the music and that they were uh, calling into Dewey Phillips. And he always said, if I can find a white singer who can sing like a Negro, I'll make a million dollars. All of a sudden, one day, I just got a sudden uh, uh, ur uh, urge to go in this, in this recording studio, which was Mr. Sam Phillips' uh -huh. Memphis recording service. And so he paid, it was a few bucks, to go into a booth and sing a couple of songs, which he was going to give to his mother. Sam's assistant, Mary Ann Keisker, said that when she was recording him, she heard something that just struck her. And so usually what she would do is record the acetates and then give them to the customer. But for some reason, she's heard something in Elvis's delivery or his voice, and she recorded it on a piece of tape so that she could play it for Sam. Whenever Sam came back, Sam Phillips came in and Marion Keisker for a year tried to convince him that this is the guy. You know, this is the guy that you're looking for. In January 1954, while preparing for his career break, he met the 16-year-old Dixie Locke at church. They hit it off. I do remember the first time I saw Elvis. He was so um, different, so totally different from all the rest of the guys that, you know, that I went to church with and went to school with. Um, just something about him that just even then, as a young teenager, really, that he had just such a, a charismatic appeal to I guess. Uh, and besides the fact that he was the best looking thing on the world, you know. <laughs> They'd often go to hear gospel singers at the Assembly of God Church, the All Black East Trig Baptist Church, and marathon all night gospel singings at Ellis Auditorium. Now that was, of course, one of our big favorite things to do. We never missed one. We would go down and just um, one quartet after the other just sing all night long. So it was kind of in our blood from the time we were kids. That was his life. Making music was his life, and that's all he, he wanted to do. You were just uh, entertained and almost mesmerized to just listen, and listen to him talk, you know, and things, plans that he had for his life and things that he wanted to do. So it was, uh, it was a very exciting time. While Elvis was following his dream, the U.S. Supreme Court rocked the South with its decision in Brown versus the Board of Education on May 5th, 1954. That ruling said the practice of segregated schools, or separate but equal, was unconstitutional. Integration was now the law. Local ordinances are gonna be done away with state statutes. Uh, no longer the law of the land. Um, I mean, federal policy is different. And every vocal politician in the South is hostile to the idea, or at least forced to be hostile. While the social order of the Old South was in flux, Elvis had much more immediate concerns, his stalled music career. He still hoped he'd hear from Sam Phillips, and he told me that he might call me sometime, you know. And he called you. So he called me. It was a year and a half later. I was, a, I was, a, I was an old man. In June of 1954, Elvis Presley finally got the call he'd been waiting for. Sam Phillips of Sun Records wanted him to record a song. For the session, Sam put Elvis together with bassist Bill Black and guitar player Scotty Moore. I went with him to uh, the studio several times when they were practicing and trying to get the right sound. Nothing was working. And Mr. Phillips called for a break, and they started messing around. They were doing That's All Right, Mama. And he came back in and said, what was that? And they go, we don't know. We were just goofing around. He said, we'll do it again. It became one of those sessions 
where they just gelled. They gelled, but the sound was very different. By July 5th, they had their first record, That's All Right Mama, with a radical new sound for the era. A white man singing a song originally recorded by a black man, Arthur Crudup. I think it was Bill Black later said, if we keep, keep this up, you know, we're going to get run out of town because it was such a distinctive sound for the time. Like it was going to cause uh, some big trauma, you know, if you listen to this kind of music. <laughs> The whole different, different sound that made you want to dance and, you know, clap your hands. Sam took the record over to Dewey Phillips. I happened to be in the studio the night that uh, Sam Phillips walked in with uh, a record called That's All Right Mama by a truck driving singer by the name of Elvis Presley. And all of a sudden, we heard this commotion, and the phones lit up like a Christmas tree. And I didn't know what happened. I heard this sound of this recording, and it was so different from anything that I had ever heard. Dewey asked me if I would uh, see if I could uh, get a hold of uh, his parents and find out where Elvis was so that they could bring him down to the station. And I got Elvis's home phone number. Yeah. And I called in his mother ain't phone. I said, uh, Mrs. Presley, I said, is Elvis at home? She said, no, he's down here watching the Western the D'Souza. <laughs> He was so nervous, he went to see a double feature at the Suzor's on Decatur. And so uh, they got in their truck. They went down, actually, themselves, Vernon and, and Gladys, and uh, walked up and down the aisle, found Elvis sitting there by himself, and said, you know, the all hell's breaking loose. So Elvis almost ran down to the radio station because uh, the Suzor was on North Main and the Chiska was on South Main. So he easily could have made it in 10 minutes. Elvis sat down. And uh, Dewey, unbeknownst to Elvis, had his microphone on, and so he started talking to him immediately. One of the first things he asked him um, was, what school do you go to? And that was kind of a pivotal moment in the interview because by saying he was, had gone to Hume's High, Elvis was letting everybody know he was a white guy. So it was a very shrewd moment on Dewey Phillips' show because instantly, listeners knew they were listening to a white guy who was saying like that. Because a lot of the people who had been calling in apparently thought that Elvis was black because he was singing the rhythm and blues, you know, number, and um, so they weren't sure. It was a night that, you know, is ingrained in my memory simply because we knew all of us in the studio, in the radio station that night, who experienced this excitement, knew that something really special was happening. But little did we know that, uh, that music was changing that very night from what we had known it growing up as kids. It didn't sound like anything else on the air at that time, and he caught the public's fancy. I'll tell you one thing, before the day was over, everybody in town was talking about Elvis Presley. It was that quick in Memphis. It was instant. It's like a rocket, you know? It's, it's already left the launch, you know? It's not coming back, it's not coming back. So it was just kind of stand and watch what's going on. It started in Memphis, and then it took a while to spread it. There was some, some uh, reluctance, some disc jockeys, to play it. Because they, they complained it sounded like black. Wherever they played the record, it was all over. Even his hometown station, Tupelo's WELO, refused to play it. So we started getting phone calls. When are you going to play Elvis' new record? And so uh, reluctantly, we put it on. And that was the beginning of the rock era. By October, it had sold over 6,000 copies to blacks and whites. Elvis was a crossover hit. I think he did understand the universality of music. And I think it touched him. He understood that music as his in the same way that, quote, they, black musicians thought of it as, as theirs. And so he, he's able to transcend, I think, the social conflict, the political conflict. He's not a part of it. Sam Phillips started booking the band into local venues like the Overton Park Shell in Memphis where he shared the bill with country star Slim Whitman. One newspaper ad misspelled his name, listing him as Ellis Presley. They didn't even get his name right. But once he steps on the stage, something is starting to happen. That was the first time I had seen him on stage, and the first time that 
you know, I saw just people, just hundreds of girls screaming and hollering and trying to get uh, to him, you know, and I thought, wow. I mean, I knew he had that effect on me, but I didn't think that he was going to have that effect on everybody that saw him. All of a sudden, he looked down, and the crowd was yelling, and he looked down, and he was shaking his leg and shook a little more, <laughs> and they started screaming a little more. Well, he did that from the first day. I just, the way he felt, you know. And he was always gyrating, what they, they call gyrating. And uh, he was always moving around. Yeah, I don't think he could have stood still if you'd have paid him to stand still. Well, I tell you, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not doing it on purpose. I mean, I'm aware of everything I do at all times, but it's just the way I feel. I mean, if, if I were, I, I can just picture somebody singing uh, a rock and roll song standing real still. I mean, I, I, actually, I'd go nuts standing there, you know? Mm -hmm. As word of mouth spread, the band was hired to play during intermissions at a popular local club, the Eagle's Nest. Ironically, the lead act included Hugh Jeffries, who had beaten Elvis in the Tupelo talent show when he was 11. Neither one recognized the other. And uh, at the Eagle's Nest, as many times as we uh, saw each other out there, we had no idea that we were standing side by side. <laughs> Elvis began to show the crowds that he was different from anybody that ever seen. Yeah, he came out in a pink uh, jacket and uh, unbuttoned shirt, no tie. But uh, that was typical of him. The crowd couldn't get enough. Even then, uh, Elvis, when he was on the bandstand, he strummed his guitar and the girls <laughs> melted. <laughs> It was really something. And they, uh, they wouldn't let him go, you know. 30-minute uh, intermission, you know, they, they'd keep him if, uh, if they could, you know. The club appearances helped sell records, but he wasn't making enough money to quit his day job. He was staying very busy because he still was driving that truck in the daytime for that Crown Electric Company and at nighttime doing gigs and going out on the weekends. In October of 1954, Sam Phillips scored a major victory for its fledgling stars. He secured an audition spot for Elvis and the band at Nashville's Ryman Auditorium, the home of the Grand Ole Opry. This was the fulfillment of a dream for Elvis. He'd listened to the Grand Ole Opry on the radio since he was a kid. To him, the Ryman was the pinnacle of the music business. It was the cathedral of country music. And Elvis, he might have been a, a little tiny bit country, but he was a lot of other things. Elvis chose to play the anthem of country music made famous by Bill Monroe. Bill Monroe is very established here. He'd been appearing on the Ryman Opry programming since 1939. The father of bluegrass music, he's already known as that. And he had a song called Blue Moon of Kentucky. And it was a waltz. It was a mournful waltz. Blue moon of Kentucky, keep on shining. But it was his song, and it belonged as much to the people here as it belonged to him. And this young kid, 19 years old, from Memphis, walks out on this stage, and he sings Blue Moon of Kentucky in a 4-4 cut time. Oh, well, I say Blue Moon of Kentucky, just to keep on shining. And the crowd is underwhelmed uh, by the performance because of what he has done to one of their standards. Elvis said, Jim Denny, who was in charge of the opera, told me to go back to Memphis driving my truck. They really thought he was rock and roll, and they didn't want that at the Grand Ole Opry. In spite of the setback Elvis suffered at the Grand Ole Opry, Sam Phillips was undeterred. Pressing on, he secured a booking on the Shreveport-based Louisiana Hayride starting in November of 1954. The Hayride was similar to the Opry, but more nurturing. The Opry was for made talent. You had to be somebody to get on the show. It was a showcase of stars. And the Louisiana Hayride earned its name as the cradle of the stars because they would give unknowns an opportunity to perform on this stage. 
Well, the Hayride was actually the second biggest country show. It had been on since the 40s, actually. So it was very big, very popular. And uh, so that's, uh, that's how he got so popular, I guess. You got to remember when the Hayride and the Grand Ole Opry was in existence, you didn't have TV. And people didn't have anything to really do but listen to radio or go out at night and get a hamburger or go ride and go to a drive-in. The simple things of life. The shows broadcast on Shreveport's KWKH radio were heard throughout Louisiana, East Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee every Saturday night. At first, the producers weren't sure what to think of Elvis. He was dressed a little differently from everybody else, of course. And uh, the others had on their Western clothes and their, their nude outfits. And uh, he was uh, had on white bucks, I believe, uh, pink coat. Horace Logan was the producer of the show. And the head MC, and Horace usually, introduced the important people. He wasn't too sure about Elvis. So at the very last minute, he says, Frank, you do it. He's only 19 years old. He has a new, distinctive style. Elvis Presley, let's give him a nice hand. Elvis, how are you this evening? But he was very nervous, and he asked what he ought to do. And I said, just do what you've been doing prior to now. I said, do, do what you do naturally. Well, I'd like to say how happy we are to be down here. It's a real honor for us to be, get a chance to appear on the Louisiana Hayride. We're going to do a song for you. You got anything else to say, sir? No, I'm ready. We're going to do a song for you. We've got on Sun Record. It goes something like this. Why, that's all right, Mama. That's all right with you. He came that's out and right. did his thing. And uh, it, was, uh, it was different because uh, he did all the gyrations that later on were, were accepted by everybody. But, gee, they, everybody thought this was a, an immoral thing that he was doing, you know, doing... Uh, all these twisting and and all this kind of stuff. Well, now my mama, she done told me, Papa done told me too. Son, that guy you were fooling with, she ain't no good for you, but that's all right. Artists for the seven, eight years previous to Elvis would just come out and crowd around a single microphone and belt out their latest song with no concern for tapping their feet or taking off and dragging the microphone to the side of the stage or blowing kisses at the girls in the audience. The crowd was noticeably unimpressed. There was an old country crowd. And uh, they never seen anybody run across the stage and jump and hoop and holler, you know, like he did. So they was all shocked. What is this boy doing to our country music, you know? The audience didn't grab on to Elvis uh, immediately because it was an adult audience primarily. So it took a few weeks for the word to get out that Elvis was here and he was making moves on stage that were, uh, you know, really something else. And so the next thing you know, we had kids coming. The old people, could, they just quit coming. Those kids wanted to see Elvis and they made so much noise, they couldn't hear their favorite act, you know. So that's, uh, that's how it got really started big. He was asked to become a member of the Louisiana Hayride Show, which was a big, big deal for him. The band asked drummer DJ Fontana to join them. Next thing you know, we was working all the time, every weekend somewhere. And man, we was working ballparks, uh, high school gyms, uh, on the back of trucks. We was working anything he could. Well, he had to work. He didn't, there was no money, you know. Just they didn't give him was about 100, 150 dollars a night for all of us. So we had to work seven nights a week, you know, to, to make a living. It's while he's performing at the Louisiana Hayride that he starts to go out on the road. And I believe, you know, during one three-month period, they logged 25,000 miles on a car. We had one car. It was pretty tight, and uh, the, the bass fiddle was up, you know, the big bass. And we put that inside the car, and the tail end of it go up in the window, and the neck would go in the front seat. You know, it's just all across. If anybody's gonna sleep in an Elvis, which was Elvis, he'd sleep under the base in the back seat. But it was fun, you know, we were a bunch of young guys. And we weren't worried about the money even. We didn't worry about the money. We just going out and having a good time, see what we can create for Elvis, you know. 
They were building an audience one gig and one radio station at a time. We'd see a big antenna up there out in the middle of nowhere, and we'd go out there and stop and bring our Elvis's record. And use it as a, it was a disc jockey in this little booth, in this little house. That's all it was, a small room, about as big as this room right here. And we'd go in, and they was glad to see us, because we was the only one out there. Nobody out there except him by himself. So when, they, when we come in, they said, will you play this? Yeah. Sometimes they'd play one, you know, they always go get his guitar, and they'd play, and, and just, that's what he, I guess that's how we got our records played. They're performing wherever they can get a gig. And as they're doing it, people are starting to talk about that Presley boy. They're calling him that Presley boy. There's something exciting going on. At first, no one knew what to call their new sound. They didn't quite know what it was. And, well, we didn't either. No, we didn't know what to call it. Well, we didn't know what to call it anything. The beginning of rock and roll, you know, and, and it pulled in a lot of the uh, a lot of the blues and a lot of the black music that was coming in. And of course, uh, being from the Deep South, um, I don't know how much this you want me to say, but you know, you couldn't, uh, you weren't supposed to listen to it. And it was just great. Without meaning to, and really without understanding it, he's a point of conflict because it's not just um, the mingling of blues and rock, it's also his reliance on a music that is quote, in the minds of some, really sinful. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels when you sing it. I know what it does to you. And I, I know uh, the evil feeling that you feel when you sing it. In the paper and everything, the preachers, you know, uh, it's devil music. Of course, that made it even more <laughs> enticing to all of us, you know. In spite of the protests by the church, the press, and many worried parents, the band kept attracting bigger and bigger crowds. The concerns that young girls would find their sound irresistible were well found. In the 50s, we wouldn't have said the word sex aloud, but I think that's what Elvis was, you know, that I think that it was just a raw sexual urge that he projected that, that just and turn, that just turned on uh, all, you know, all the young girls. I think every girl that ever looked at him would have wanted to go out with him. Only a few got that chance. In June of 1955, while playing at the Airmen's Club in Biloxi, Mississippi, Elvis noticed a young woman in the audience, June Wanico. June, who's still popular with Elvis fans, caught his eye and agreed to go out with him. And that's the first time I've ever kissed on the first date. And I have never been kissed like that since. I'm sorry, all you guys out there that I've dated before, but I've never been kissed by, by anyone as good as a good a kisser. You know, that's everybody wants to know that question. And I just say, with those lips he was born with, how could he not be a good kisser? Elvis asked June to join him on his tour, but she thought that was rushing things. Parting ways, they lost touch. I was not following his career. I just had my memories of that one long, long date and that magical time. It's around this time that someone in Memphis gives Colonel Tom Parker a call and says, you know, there's, there's a boy out here you might want to come and take a look at. The Colonel would change Elvis's life forever. He got together one night at a coffee shop with Elvis and a guy named Bob Neal, who was then managing Elvis and the guys and Sam Phillips. And they all had a talk about Elvis's career and the direction he'd like to take it. This direction didn't include Bob Neal, and it wouldn't include Sam Phillips or Sun Records. The Colonel understands the enormity of Elvis's potential. And what the Colonel understands is that Elvis can go beyond Sun Records. And it's through Colonel Tom Parker that Elvis will get his deal with RCA Records. In November 1955, Parker brokered a deal with RCA that bought Sun's rights to Elvis for $40,000, a record amount at the time. Well, one time, we was, uh, me and Sam were in the control room. He just happened to say that, well, if you're going to make a mistake, make a $12 million mistake. Well, he should have said a billion dollar mistake. Chet Atkins, who was assigned to produce the first RCA recording session, 
wasn't betting on its success. He hired only one of the backup singers Elvis requested. He said, oh, don't make a difference. Just come on, come on in and do some movies and arts. He's just a, Elvis is just a passing fad. He ain't going to be around long. Don't make any difference. Just do some movies and arts. The first recording session went good because Elvis knew pretty much what he was doing. And, of course, Heartbreak Hotel swept the country overnight. It's a million. The first one, Heartbreak, which is unheard of. Nobody ever got a million sell out right out of the chute. And after that, it was one million after another. The colonel kept things moving. Parker negotiated a buyout of the Hayride contract and set his sights on TV. We had never done that before, a bunch of hillbillies out of Tennessee and Louisiana. What do we know about television, you know? And it was new anyhow to most of the people. So again, we just got up there and we did the best we could. The first TV break came in Elvis audition for the stage show a variety series hosted by the Dorsey Brothers that was produced by Jackie Gleason. He said, I knew I had to look different from Mr. Gleason. He said, I just couldn't walk in dressed like anybody else. He said, so I got me a real shark with green suit and a green shirt and a green tie. And he said, I walked in with that, you know, long hair and, and my, my movements and all. And I said, what happened, Elvis? He said, Jackie Gleason looked up and he said, son, I don't know what the hell you do, but you look so different. You got, you got to be a star. The one and only Elvis Presley. Elvis's career was really taking off. Starting in January of 1956, he made the first of six guest appearances on the Dorsey Brothers musical variety show, followed by two weeks on Milton Berle's program. The audience grew every time he was on TV. TV appearances were squeezed in between a non-stop schedule of live performances held in ever larger venues. In April, he started a month-long engagement at the New Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas, a town that would become synonymous with Elvis Presley. By May of 1956, the constant work gave him enough money to buy a modern ranch-style house in an upper middle class Memphis neighborhood for himself and his parents. It had only been three years since the family lived in public housing in Lauderdale Courts. He really took care of his mother. Well, that's why he bought the house, for her. He didn't need a house, you know, not really. He was always on the road, so why would he need a house? The quiet, well-tended neighborhood was the model of suburban respectability. His mother loved the big backyard. She's always sitting out in the backyard. She had chickens back there and ducks and all. All kinds of stuff in the city. You ain't supposed to have those things there. But she did. She's always back there feeding the chickens, doing something. The chicken is racing motorcycles down the street, and a constant stream of visitors and fans outside the gates created tension. If you look at the, the front of the house, there's that front door, and to the right, is that, that room that extends out is uh, Elvis's first bedroom, and I can guarantee you every teenager knew that. They would jump into the yard and go up to that bedroom window and bang on the windows. The neighbors, where he was, they were really complaining because we'd be sitting out there at his house 11, 11.30, and, uh, uh, girls would catch a cab from the airport. They knew where he lived. One of the first visitors he spotted outside in the crowd was June Juanico. Turns me around and he said, June, what are you doing in Memphis? And I said, I'm gulp, you know. <laughs> I'm here with friends. We're on vacation. Yeah. And he said, how long are you going to be here? And I said, I don't know, at least a week. And he said, I'm not letting you out of my sight. And then we were inseparable. After a whirlwind week, Elvis hit the road. His notoriety and star power were on the rise. His sexy rendition of Hound Dog had sent Milton Berle's ratings through the roof. Other broadcasters who shunned Elvis were now in hot pursuit. Steve Allen, who was in a ratings war with Ed Sullivan, 
offered him $5,500 to appear on his primetime NBC show on July 1st. They just did not know what to do with him. They, they, they made a cowboy out of him, had a cowboy hat on him with the Imogen Coker, you remember the Andy Griffith and him. Ooh, Lord, that, that, he didn't like that at all. Next, they asked Elvis to sing to a basset hound. All they knew to do was bring a, a dog, and, and Elvis would say, you and that damn dog, you know, t that's, what, that's what he would say about it. I think he was just trying to put him down. Well, if you're going to do that, why, why hire him to do your show, you know? Because the ratings would just go sky high for all those guys. Steve knew it. I think St Steve Allen was one of those people who considered himself to be the tastemakers in this country. And obviously, this was tasteless. And so he was making fun of it. Well, if you wanted to get along with Elvis, you didn't mention the Steve Allen show. <laughs> he hated that show. He didn't uh, like Steve till the day he died for pulling that off on him. Controversy continued to swirl around Elvis, while tastemakers like Steve Allen dismissed him as a passing fad. Staunch segregationists saw him as a genuine threat. Here's a guy, hillbilly cat. We can't tell. Is he black? Is he white? What is he? And so I think that's a threat, because he's dissolving, in many ways, the racial distinctions. And that threatens these people. Everything's tied together. The Brown decision, public school, desegregation, rock and roll music, Elvis Presley. I think it illustrates the fear that black and white in the South are going to come together. They are going to uh, lead a charge, a highly publicized charge, uh, against rock and roll. They are going to call for the banning of rock and roll records. Uh, they are going to call for jukebox operators to uh, take those records off their jukebox. We've uh, set up a 20-man committee to do away with these, this vulgar, animalistic <laughs> rock and roll box. If they, if, they can't, if they can't tell by looking at the name of the record, whether it's a <laughs> singer or, or a <laughs> version of this rock and roll box, they'll play the record and just use their judgment in whether it should come off or not. Some believe Elvis was at risk. I think it would have been more dangerous for him if the children hadn't gravitated to him with such enthusiasm. Uh, I mean, they were mesmerized by him, enthralled by him, in love with him. How much they loved him was brought home when Elvis came back to Memphis after the Steve Allen show to perform as part of a July 4th benefit concert at the Rustwood Baseball Park. Across town at the Overton Park Shell, only 3,500 people braved the heat to hear Senator Eastland rail against integration. Elvis' sold-out concert attracted a mixed-race audience of 14,000 fans who were whipped into a panic as he, quote, shimmied, squirmed, and wiggled. The controversy, the constant touring, the growing crowds, the demands of the media, all were taking a toll. Elvis needed a break. He headed to Biloxi to see June Juanico. And we just, we were together constantly. And, you know, and we'd cut up and, and kiss and wrestle and just do. When you're in love and you're, you know, you could just chew somebody up. Skeet shooting, fireworks, day trips to New Orleans, and horseback riding filled their days. We were crazy. We were kids. We were, we were having fun. I mean, you know, uh, nothing too daring, nothing too to um, out of range, nothing, I mean, everything was just, let's do it. Elvis invited June to join him on his upcoming Florida tour. He would do two or more shows daily, and the crowds couldn't get enough. Oh, he connected with the audience like you wouldn't believe, you know? You, I know you've seen photographs of him actually lying down on stage, singing in the microphone, and he would do all kind of funny things, you know? And every time he'd do something different, every, the, the girls would scream. And you know the press called him vulgar. 
He said, man, that's the farthest thing from my mind is being vulgar. My mom would whip me if I, if I were, were vulgar. In Jacksonville, the last city on their Florida tour, a civic group filed a petition with local judge Marion Gooding, hoping he'd censor Elvis's upcoming performances. The judge called the sinful young singer into his chambers and told him that he would accept wiggling from side to side, but no back and forth motions. So instead of doing his little, when they did a roll on the drums, how Elvis would cut up with that roll on the drums, instead of him doing anything like this, he would go like this. Da -da 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 and the crowd would scream. He was perfectly still. And he wiggled his little finger to the drums. And they would go wild. Those three shows won Elvis a lot of new fans, including one no-nonsense judge sitting quietly in the back row. As he completed his tour, Hollywood came calling. The Colonel had secured him a movie deal. On Friday, August 17th, he reported for work on the Civil War drama, Love Me Tender. This was his first shot at the silver screen, something Elvis had always dreamed about. But some would argue that the most important career break for the controversial singer was about to come, an appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. Ed Sullivan saw him on the Steve Allen show, and he signed him for three shows, which was uh, the greatest thing that ever happened to Elvis. When you do the Ed Sullivan show back then, that was as far as you could go. That was the highest. It was a rating smash, and they'd get an endorsement from Ed Sullivan after the third show. Ed Sullivan, you know, walked over and said, this is an all right guy, regardless of what you think about him. And at that time, Elvis really needed that to boost his career. It's like a coronation for Elvis Presley. Suddenly, to many people, he's not quite as scary as they thought. Imagine one kid from Tupelo gets on television and because of a performance, shakes the soul of a society. 1956 was Elvis Presley's rocket ride to superstardom. It all happened so fast, and so I didn't even have time to think about it. it uh, everything just, just just like, like that, that, you know? And, uh, and he just kept going and still doing that way, and I, I, I can't even think about it. In fact, uh, I don't even like to wake up in the morning. I'm afraid I might wake up. Well, it might be all over. I'm afraid I might be back driving a truck. I heard uh, one time uh, from a reporter that it was quoted from Elvis that um, 1956 was the best year of his life. But the road to fame was about to bring him full circle. In September 1956, Elvis Presley was returning to his hometown, Tupelo, Mississippi. His manager, Colonel Parker, had arranged a special homecoming concert at the State Fair. Elvis said, more than anything else, I want the folks back home to think right of me. Anytime you play your hometown, you're fighting a battle, because they don't like you now. You know, you're in the left town and become a big star, and the local people just don't like you. That's not only him, everybody. I think that day, um, there had to be uh, somewhere inside Elvis Presley, almost a fear, a doubt, a question, as he goes back. He was still the little kid coming home that sometimes was made fun of, that sometimes people didn't want to hear sing, that people remembered in clothes that didn't fit. And you know, all of this goes through one's mind when they're trying to go back. Colonel Parker also wasn't sure about how the hometown crowd would react. To cover his bases, he booked a Dixieland band, the Carter sisters, and a popular singer, Dolores Watson. Maybe the Colonel thought that all of this would work out and people who didn't like him would come to see something else. Because who knows what's going to happen when this kid from the other side of the tracks hits that stage. I mean, you know, there are rumblings about Elvis, uh, and there are rumors about Elvis, but nobody knows just what this is about. But the town turned out for Elvis. Banners were stretched across Main Street that said, Tupelo welcomes Elvis home. This parade is in his honor. Oh, you know he had to be thrilled. I think it is a triumph for him. He's coming back, and there's a parade in his honor. 
I mean, that's a pretty amazing thing for a guy that his biggest performance previously was was at the show at the fair when he was like nine years old, you know, singing Old Shep. Every band was asked to perform an Elvis song, but it was all Elvis. Everything was Elvis. Backstage, Elvis and his parents saw people they hadn't seen in years. My guess is people shook hands with Vernon Presley, who'd never shaken hands with him before, patted him on the back, uh, reached out to his mother. Vernon says, do you want to go in and see the boy? I said, yeah, we'd like to see Elvis. But I said, we can't get in. He said, just follow me. I get to go backstage and, and meet him and uh, present him with this hat and put it on his head. And with that, he just grabbed me and hugged me and kissed me. Oh, I could have just died at the moment. <laughs> the greatest experience for a little teenage girl that you can ever imagine. The Colonel didn't have to worry about attracting the crowd. They were literally hanging off the grandstand. The place was packed. There were more people in the grandstand than in the city of Tupelo, by far. We thought it never would get time, you know. We'd, we'd look at, uh, what time is it? We'd ask so, so and so, say, what time is it? How much longer is it until it starts? None of us could recall the opening act. Uh, we, we just knew Elvis was coming out. And then he comes. And, uh, and I will always remember uh, his first line. He says, Seeing all you folks out here today just brings a big lump up in my wallet. And there's just a, it takes a minute before it sinks in. And then there's, then there's this laughter and applause, and then he goes into his act. We just sort of all just rushed to the front, and so did a lot of other people. But luckily, we got up front right at the stage. I think we started screaming. I just think we all started squealing, you know? That's just what I remember, just screaming and screaming. When he was up there on that stage, just screaming. <laughs> just because he just because he was there and we were there, and he was powerful. I didn't know that things like that happened. Mass hysteria. And uh, there was screaming and crying to get on the stage with him. That's, it, it was a thing that I couldn't believe what I was saying. And nobody else could have lived here. He was so charismatic that, that they, you couldn't ignore it. You knew that this fellow was on his way forever. You know, there's not much profundity about Elvis, but something very profound was taking hold in the whole world of music. You almost knew it was music history, and I don't know how to explain that. It was such a good time of our lives to be teenagers and be young and be free. It was a moving experience for him and his parents. I feel for sure his parents were just exuberant because they got the red carpet treatment. And when they were here, they were so poor. I uh, was really proud for Gladys and Vernon, you know, to have that opportunity to see him do that. I think there was something about him that day that opened Tupelo's eyes substantially changed that town's attitude about Elvis. And I think Tupelo has continued to be very proud of uh, Elvis for being a native son. The two biggest events in Tupelo would be Elvis's return and uh, the Tupelo tornado. Both shook things up. He left a legacy that still resonates today. You know, it's really been mind-boggling to me what he has become, because I think he is so much more than just a country singer now and just a rock and roll uh, singer. He's, he's an inspiration to a lot of people. I mean, for him, it was the music. It's the music that moved him. And ultimately, through him, it moved a whole generation of kids, white and black. I think one reason why he's still paid attention to you today 
is because he showed the possibilities. That it doesn't matter where you were born, it doesn't matter what circumstances you were in. You can still change yourself, and in that sense, change the world. We need an Elvis now, really. Somebody to come along and shake him up. It's got to happen sooner or later. Somebody will come out of left field like he did and, and, and bust the music world wide open. It'll, it'll eventually happen, but not anytime soon. <laughs>